night's demonstrator is John Huff. He's mm -hmm. going to be uh, showing us different work holding techniques. Some of them, uh, from looking at the tools, some of them are going to be new to me. I hope uh, something new for everybody. Thanks, Jim. Well, like I said, my name's John, and you can see I'm a bit of a tool junkie. <laughs> and so I thought tonight I would try to, you know, bring in some stuff that's, you know, clearly things that you use every day, but also some things that, you know, maybe you hadn't seen before. So without really digging too deep, we're going to, I'll just start with, uh, you know, obviously you have two options with a lathe. You can turn between centers or you can either, you can hold in a chuck or hold in a fixture. So that's really the options you have. Um, and uh, so here's the chucks. This is the spindle stuff and unless there's any questions. <laughs> it's hot, we'll all go home. Hey, hold up that sign. Repeat the question. The question is, why am I here in July? That's the question. And Jim can answer that, but we won't go there. So anyway, um, I'll start with the spindle stuff because there's more of that, and you guys are pretty familiar with chucks, so I'm not going to get too deep into that. But, you know, clearly the, the simplest uh, form of, uh, I guess I have to come over here, the simplest form of uh, uh, spindle drive is to use uh, an inserted uh, drive like this and this is a typical four uh, four prong drive these are really good for you know really anything the only trouble with them is uh, they have a quite a bite and if you get a catch uh, you'll remember it with this particular type of drive is they're they're pretty stout um, they do come in different sizes this is a pretty good size one um, next on that one and the next in the order of uh, what do you want to call it? Ease would be. These are step centers. I'm sure you're all familiar with those. This one just happens to be in a in a uh, sleeve adapter for a Morris taper three, but they generally come at two or three Morris taper, and and they come in different sizes. You can get them up to about like an inch and a quarter or so. And the nice thing about these are one, the the tip uh, recedes when you bring it into your work, <coughs> and the the advantage of that is it won't split out your wood. And the other advantage is the teeth they grip, but if you get a catch, they tend to spin off, so you don't get a really ugly catch. And they they uh, they run a lot. I think they're they're easier on your on your nerves, <laughs> if you will. John. Yeah. That first one you showed, I use for uh, turning bowls, uh, the roughing out of the bowl. This one. The first when you start. Yeah. Right. You have to chisel off the bark. Yeah. Stick it in there. And Mari is talking about uh, using this one like for uh, green wood, and and uh, if you're using a natural edge bowl when you start out in the bark. And it gives a lot more bite into the bark. So, and that's a. Since you brought that up, we'll just talk. This one's also uh, for that same sort of thing where you're uh, working on a on a piece that might not be cut exactly square. So this is great for chainsaws, that sort of thing where the cut might be a little bit off. So you only have two points to it. I don't know if you can see that, but there's only two points to drive. So if you're a little off, you get a better uh, you better a better grip. This doesn't have the. Uh, receding point either so when you drive that one in like it's, it's home for good so you get a catch for this one you'll remember that too in the uh this is something that's a little unusual and these came with a pattern makers lathe i bought and uh, i've never used these before but these are chisel point uh drives and this is a little tiny guy it's in a this is just in a sleeve adapter too and this is a bigger Morris Tabor 3, but that's a beefy one. That looks like a big nail. Uh, but anyway, it would also do, I think this probably, well, I know it predates a step center by a bunch, uh, but I'm going to guess that that's, that was the idea here, was that it would, you could drive that in a bit, but if you did get a catch, it would spin off without, you know, without really scaring you or making you change your shorts. Um, and then these two are, I think these are kind of fascinating little drives here. These are um, split center drives. So therefore, you know, if you make a, let's say you were making uh, columns or something for a piece of furniture and you're doing reeded columns and you, you generally turn the whole column at once and then glue two halves together and then split the halves and you'd have identical columns for both sides. That's basically what these are for. But um, these came out of a pattern maker shop as well. And I think they were used because those patterns tend to be a bit larger and what you do is you build your pattern piece. Um, it's going to roll off, but you build your pattern piece. Um, let's say it was two split halves that were like a four by four, and split down the middle and glued on paper. Well, you wouldn't really want to stick that between centers and spin that up to 600 RPM because you're likely to lose those two halves at that at that rate. So what they would do is 
is cut a tenon on the end and then that tenon would slip into this slot. And what this allows it, this is your tailstock side and this is your headstock side. So this side's solid, this side spins. So you'd get a nice solid hold on a split pattern and not have to worry about it coming apart. So I just thought those were very cool. And you're not gonna see that in the catalog anywhere. <laughs> So uh, obviously when you're doing uh, centers, you need something on the other end of it. So uh, live centers are, I think that everybody uses a live center now, but in the old days, you used to use a cup centers. And when I first started, that was cup centers were the way to go. And then you just use a uh, candle wax or paraffin or oil on the end of it. But it, you really had to leave like a half an inch on the end of your project to cut off because this would really stain up the, and mar the, the tail end of the piece. So everybody now uses these live centers with the ball bearings in them and I, I really like those. They're, they're really nice. You can get them in, in uh, different sizes and you can get them in a bull nose pattern as well. So that's so that if you want to come up on uh, you know, like a hollow form, just like if you're, I just use this as an example, but you can come up on a hollow form and it'll hold the other end of it. So. Both of them obviously go in the, in the tail stock. <clears throat> oh, there's one way also makes a one where you can change out all these tips, and I think that's a great that's a great uh, improvement. Then I think that's probably the, the leap from here to here. That next leap is that that one way system with the changeable tips. So that's still on my Christmas list. One other spindle form is a, a spindle chuck or a uh, this is called a rosette chuck, and it's uh, just a big, a big uh, screw chuck with a uh, Morris taper on it. But you might note it doesn't have a. Uh, there's no way to draw that into your into the taper. So this has to be used. Something like this would have to be used in conjunction with the tailstock, because if you had any sideward pressure on that, it would eventually wobble out of the out of the headstock and, and create all kinds of problems. I've been using it as a ball, part of a ball chuck. So this thing just spins on there and, and then there's you know room to hold it for a ball. Probably a less, kind of a less used chuck is just a one you make yourself. So this one just happens to be out of a piece of uh, exotic wood. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it's an oily, kind of like a teak wood. Uh, so and I was using it uh, in the tailstock as a support and it like self oiling and it just happened to be for whatever I was working on at the time and I, I don't even remember what it was it was uh, it worked to uh, just to hold something temporarily so if, if you come into an issue where you know you, you come up against something you need to hold that's a bit odd um, you, there's nothing that says you can't make your own these tapers aren't terribly difficult to make and uh, so it's a uh, you know they're great for one-off kind of things or for some of you guys that make uh, production runs of you know stuff that you sell, I think this is a real economical way to to do business when you're when uh, you know you got stuff that you need quickly, but you don't want to spend a lot of money on tooling. Um, so there's other other chucks or other spindle type chucks, but or uh, spindle adapters. Oh. This particular one is, screws into the spindle and it's, a, it's just called a spindle chuck. It's just basically a drill chuck and allows you to hold little stuff and work on little fussy things. So those are pretty neat to have. Uh, I don't know that you can, I don't think that Jacobs makes these anymore. If they did, you probably wouldn't want one at the prices they charge, but they are, I see them quite a bit on uh, eBay and at tool shows and things and they're usually under a hundred bucks. So. And you can get them in, this is a one and eight. They come in one and a quarter, one and a half, eight, and some larger sizes as well. So these are real handy for uh, uh, doing small work. A cheaper version of that is just a Morris taper. And you could do, this could go either way. You could either use it in your tailstock as a regular drill truck, or you can go this direction, because this one has the draw bar set up on it. And you just need a piece that'll fit either get a piece of thread all or whatever to go through your chuck and this just screws on and then pulls it in and it'll hold it into your into your headstock so that you don't get any sideway pressure it's not going to have it wobble out so again it just screws onto the this is a keyless chuck so it's real handy to do again small things 
In that same vein is this thing, and this is basically just this threaded portion that will thread onto your uh, spindle. So it's the same basic issue, but it, instead of having it through a through taper with a skirt, you just do that. And this is a delta accessory. I don't know. I don't think they make these anymore, but I don't think you know a, a real machine shop. Not me. A real machine shop might be able to knock these out for a reasonable amount of money. You know, if somebody had a a desire for that sort of thing. You can also put uh, like wire wheels and, and grinding wheels and that sort of thing on there. And one of the things I haven't talked about yet was uh, anytime you're working between spindles, if you're working up close to the chuck and, uh, and your tool, if you're trying to get in sometimes like this, sometimes this kind of stuff can sort of get in the way of tooling. These things are called um, drill extenders. And these are these happen to be Morris Taper 3, but they come in Morris Taper 2, and you get two to two extenders. You put them in both ends, and all of a sudden your tooling is, you know, you're way out here in the middle. So you have all sorts of room to move around with a with your uh, lathe tooling, or um, you can chuck up a mandrel and uh, stick a wire wheel or, or a polishing wheels up on your lathe, and it gets it out of the way from the headstock. So I, I found these to be real handy. So anyway, that pretty much takes care of uh, that. Pretty much takes care of uh, doing work between centers. <clears throat> and the next, I guess, the next move over would be to talk about chucks. And everybody, I think, everybody nowadays has, you know, some form of a four jaw chuck. So this is sort of an order progression of the ones I've had. Uh, this is just a little uh, inexpensive. I don't even want to talk brands, but an inexpensive one. I, I used to think there was no difference between the inexpensive ones and the more expensive ones, and I've come to find that that's uh, probably not true. They, these work reasonably well. I think once you get to a, a particular part in your turning journey, uh, you'll find that these better chucks are a, a better buy. If I was going to advise somebody, if they're just starting out, I'd say just get the good ones and leave the low price ones alone. And that's, I just learned that over the years because what I've noticed is that um, the holding power of, of these dovetail uh, sets are much, much better than the ones on the lower price ones. And I think it's because those, the, uh, the ways here on these, uh, where the scroll is, I think there's enough play in those ways that you get, you might get a few thousandths play on the end of it, but that few thousandths makes a huge difference when it comes to hanging onto something reasonably large. This is the kind of reasonably large I'm talking about. This, this was, uh, I, I just have to show this because this was a bowl I made in seventh grade. <laughs> and I was gonna fix it up because I thought, you know, it was kind of fat and ugly. And I actually had a teacher, I was really proud of this bowl. This is my second one out because it was big and I thought that was cool. And I brought it out and the shop teacher was out there and the art teacher was standing out there. <clears throat> and the art, I thought the art teacher was my friend. And so I, I, <laughs> so I brought my fat bowl out and I said, uh, you know, my, my shop teacher was pretty proud of me. He said, you know, hey, seven, you know, seventh grade's big old 1919 Oliver lathe. I was working, it didn't scare me. I was, you know, I thought I was pretty proficient. And the, uh, the shop teacher says, yeah, you know, he did that all by himself. And the art teacher goes, uh, so, uh, so what do you think you're gonna do? And I said, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make bowls for a living. You know? He said, what, you're gonna make big old fat bowls? That's all you're gonna do? And I, I was crushed. <laughs> I thought, I thought you were my friend, man. But so anyway, I was going to take my big old fat bowl and make it into a skinny bowl, but I was using a less a lesser chuck. Let's just do that. So I had started to cut the, I cut that part out, and I was smart enough at least to put. I was starting to cut out the recess on it, and I, uh, oh, this this will lead to another part of the demonstration here later. But what I lacked was a good way to hang onto the face of this bowl. So I had it between, put the centers in it because I was smart enough to do that, and when I when I hit it, I got a little bit of a catch. It decided to depart the lathe, and you can kind of see this little spiral that went out the side, and this thing got tossed across. Uh, luckily, it did hit me, but it, you know, it clearly made a bounce off the wall, across the shop, and uh, so that sat. This has sat now for almost 10 years. Again, so it, it was. Uh, I think I did this in 1968 or 69, and uh, I touched it again in maybe 2010 or 12, <laughs> and here it sits again. And now I'll show you a little. I think I found something that'll actually hold it. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, one thing with these, these good chucks, you mm -hmm. can chuck things with just one hand too. Yeah. You know, 
That helps too, yeah. That's a great one, yeah. Well, you know, honestly, I think um, the plus to this one is that you can do this by hand, even though it's not as accurate. I like that. I like this knurled uh, nut on the back. This one where you have to balance this thing, and, and I can... <laughs> That's what I have. I've had these things for, you know, a few years now, and I still, and even though it says in on the, on the nut, I always go the wrong way the first time. <laughs> so that, I find that frustrating on the, on the chucks. That's just me. So, let's see. Um, let's move on to once you uh, once you get your chuck on your on your setup here, then obviously you know anything that can go into those four jaws is you know it seems you make a dovetail and then you're good. So you can start on one end. You can go between centers, get your dovetail set up, set your dovetail, and then you can start the rest of your, finish off the rest of your bowl. But there's lots of things that uh, you wind up with that, you know, don't quite fit into the four jaws. It's either a little bit too big, it's a little bit too small. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of what I have here tonight is buckets full of things that uh, were adapted to, you know, sort of solve that problem. The easiest one to do is a jam chuck, and this is a. See, that's why I like that one. This is one of those uh, simple, just a simple jig that uh, you set up to run. This was set up to run buttons, and you can see it's hollow. And the other part was it's set up for an, some, some kind of expensive wood. So this is a uh, rosewood in here. And what I was doing is cut these buttons off and then they jammed into a part of a, almost like a, uh, oh, like a furniture button to cover a screw head. And then the other half of this thing is just the receiver end. So you set that in the chuck, turn it down. This is the other end of it is the jam end. And then you could just spin that around and set that in the chuck and finish it off. So I actually pull it off of this one first, you part it off and then push it into your jam chuck. So it allows you to use that material right down to probably the last half inch or so of it. And you get a lot less waste that way. So jam chucks are, and little alternate jam chucks are, those are really helpful. Another form of jam chuck is one that you fit like for a specific purpose. So in this case, these were those, um, I think they were, what was the name of the guy? Raffin, Raffin scoops. These are a challenge. These are not easy to do. Number one, you got to get that little shape. That's a half a shape. So this is done, you know, in the round, and then you split it in half, and then you put it into a jig, and turn the hollow in the center. So it sounds pretty simple. Almost none of that is as simple as it sounds. Um, anyway, this was this chuck was just formed to do that, and at the time, these things would just press right into the chuck, and you could just turn it out pull another one, stick it in there, do the other side. It, that's a really challenging project. But this one was just done with tape. I just taped it onto a faceplate. I didn't even, I don't think I had, I'm not sure if I even had any chuck at that point. I was still using faceplates and sacrificial faces. So. so that's, you know, an option. Um, so uh, you could also do small parts and this is a uh, this is a little chuck that was made uh, just to do uh, knobs. So it's just a little piece that was cut down and then split, and then a, a hose clamp stuck on it, and it fits right into the jaws of a if it's open wide enough, fits into the jaws of a chuck. And it if you do these things, make sure you number the. Uh, number of the sides so that you always put them in the same jaw that you took it from otherwise you won't get a concentric cut on it so this works really nice and you just take a a blank um, so that's just like a knob blank and that just inserts in there tighten that up and then you can turn little furniture knobs. So that's 
And the nice thing about these are these outer edges are sacrificial, so you can cut right down to the, you could back up your clamp and then cut right down into that and, and do that. So those, these are, you know, they don't cost anything except for maybe, you know, buck 65 for the clamp. And uh, you get a nice little, nice little chuck. Uh, one tip on, if you're doing a bunch of knobs, a neat way to do that is if you turn it, you know, let's say you take your block and start like that and turn your spigot first. Um, this is a real challenge to get that to an exact like half inch. So if you're going to put it into drawers and that sort of thing, that you know, that once you split it, that it'll stay put. So um, the the simplest way to do that is before you start, start with a block of just a solid block of wood. Use a uh, tenon cutter or a dowel cutter, and then cut your cut your tenon with the dowel cutter, and then cut away this part on a bandsaw, and then you can chuck this up and you're ready to go with knobs. And you can knock these out fast. Uh, using that method rather than try to do it with a wrench or a you know pair of calipers, spring calipers or something. So those that works really nice. What's that? I said he was saying that's brilliant. I said yeah, I got some of those. But oh, that's not my I just idea. Never used it. Yeah. yeah, that actually I think I got that from a, this guy named Christian Beckersvort does uh, uh, shaker furniture, and that was one of his ideas was to use that use the dowel cutter. And, uh, and then I've actually seen him do that on a drill press, you know, where he forms knobs on a drill press. That's, you know, that's doing it the cheap way. But anyway, that's a, that's a nice, nice shop expedient way to do that. Um, you can also do, you want to get even more expedient. When your knobs, when you bandsaw that off, do you true that up on the lathe then, or is that your final surface of bandsaw? So if you're careful marking it out, uh, the question was, you know, do I true it up on the backside after the, after um, after cutting it with a bandsaw. If you're careful, you won't have to, but I have done it. I think, uh, I think, no, this one didn't, but I think this one needs to be trued up. You can sort of see a, I don't know if you can, you can see an edge on that. So yeah, you'd have to, that would need, a, that would need to be trued up. But even that's fairly close. I um, mean, you could back cut that a little bit so that you get a good, nice, nice tight fit on whatever you're sticking in. Just split it. And... Oh, and uh, like I said, if you want to get real cheap on your knob chucks, that's a cheap knob chuck there, and that works. By the way, you can put that in. I don't think I. Oh, no, I did number that. Put that into the. That'll, that'll turn down. You were saying about turning it the wrong way. And uh, if you buy the easy chucks, they have what's called a zoom ring on the back. Oh. And you just arr, rotate arr. that by hand. Arr, arr. And, then, and that gets it. <laughs> One, two, tight. I can see four chucks in my future. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. I, and it, they claim you don't have to worry about the the, oh, using the key. No, the number. Oh. They're all the same. Well, they I, make them to such tight standards, yeah. That it stays concentric, and you never need to do that. Wow, that's that sounds awesome. Well, I, I think expensive. I'd. Well, maybe I wouldn't be a customer. <laughs> nope, wouldn't be a customer. <laughs> but yeah, he was saying that for the for the cameras there that, that there's a chuck now that that has a zoom ring in the back that closes it in essence the same way that this one does, with the. The locking ring. That's a nice feature. Um, I don't know if the for 400. I mean, it, that's approaching metal lathe. You now that's a little cheaper than most metal lathe ones, but that's in the metal lathe range for chuck prices. That's that's up there. Anyway, if you're cheap like I am, that's a chuck. <laughs> um, oh, speaking of chucks. So we talked about, these are all four jaws, and these are, uh, well, they call them universal four jaws, or um, what's the other word? Scroll, Scroll chucks. Um, this is not. This is a four jaw independent chuck. This is a cheesy little, we'll do it this way. This is a cheesy little uh, craftsman one. Uh, but it, it does, they work. You know, they, they do what they're supposed to do, which is allows you to center something or turn off center. So I don't know if you notice the, the there's two rings that are off center there. I I stuck that in and just did that real quick just so because it's hard to explain, but it's kind of easy to say 
you can you can take your radius and move it that direction a little bit cut and then move it that way a little bit and cut so if you had a sacrificial block glued to the face of this you could be moving this up and down in any you know any direction you want to go with it so if you're looking to do something creative in that range these you know four jaw uh, independent four jaw will allow you to do that and you can usually get um, you know used independent four jaws at a fairly reasonable price I've seen it for a hundred bucks and down so um, this one would probably be like a $45 chuck or something. I guess what it was from Sears back in the day. And they might even still sell it for all I know. But I haven't used it very often, but every once in a while they come in handy. If you want to center something back that you had before, you know, that once you put it, once you take it out of this and change the orientation, you put it back in, chances are you're not going to get the exact same orientation. So for the center where that's important, that's where an independent four jaw can be real helpful. And I brought all this stuff, and I'm sure you all know that, you know, obviously with these uh, Novas and other chucks, you can get little kits for them that have cold jaws, and they have the 50 millimeter jaws, and the small spigot jaws, and you know, all the different jaw types. For them. These are really handy. I don't think I'd be without one. Um, uh, but there are there's alternatives for everything. For cold jaws, I've I have almost never had a cold jaw fit whatever I was doing. So I, I thought about making that the one that expands, you know, Longworth. the Longworth chuck. I've thought about making one of those. I, I, I just don't do that kind of stuff often enough. Um, that's one of the reasons this bowl got damaged was because I was, uh, the, the cold jaws I did have were too small for it. And uh, the attempt that I made to, to hold it didn't work. So um, what, what I've kind of come up with here is I happened to be looking on the internet when I was prepping for this thing. And there is a, there's a, there's a chuck for that. <laughs> there's a thing called a universal jam chuck. And I'd never seen this before, but it's a, basically it's a donut with a, I don't know what you'd call the material, uh, with a spongy sticky material on it. This particular material is from a yoga mat. It's a, an evolved yoga mat. Um, they were saying online that you should use um, neoprene and they were recommended like buying a used wetsuit. But used wetsuits in the middle of central Pennsylvania are a little rare. So I, uh, I tried this and this works very, very well. So basically it's just this, um, get this material out. It's this uh, spongy that's the name of it. It's a, that's off of, from Walmart. So it's, the whole roll is 20 bucks from Walmart. I'll just pass that around. Do they have it they have there at Walmart? Yeah. It's just a yoga mat. Oh, yoga mat. And, uh, but anyway, it, it uh, seems to meet the, you know, the requirements are that both sides be sticky. So some things that you can get, um, you can get a, something that has a good uh, stick to it on one side, but the other side's a little slippery. You know, like a mouse pad. Mouse pads are, are nice on one side, but the other side is meant to be slid over, so that won't hold on to things very well, which is the problem I have with that big bowl. But this one is uh, set up. Ugh. To just go on a dovetail. And the neat part about it is, and they call it a universal uh, jam chuck because you can do something as small as this little guy. It, that fits up nice. Gotta get centered, but you can go that way with it. You could go that way with it. Um, it works for something like that. And it holds nice, by the way, I did, I actually did form that with this and it didn't leave the lathe. <laughs> I thought that was pretty slick. And it'll work for just about any form that you can fit either in the inside of this or the, on the outside. So this would take a relatively large bowl and you know, given the distance you have here, you could get pretty deep on that. Um, I thought it was a pretty impressive thing. I'll, I'll, uh, Send this around. This is this is. I think it was from uh, Woodcraft's Woodcraft magazine. But this is just the basic plan of it. Just pass that around. 
anyway, I, if you if you don't have a, a jam chuck that's you know that you're really happy with, this is a cheap and easy one to to knock out. And it's just uh, uh, uses a spray adhesive to keep the to keep the material on the thing and some tape just to, otherwise this, these will spring off so the tape just kind of tends to keep it from springing off could have done a little bit neater job but I also made a, a smaller version of that so that it could go deeper on smaller bowls but this is a good example for that one because it's just more appropriate for that size and also if you have a deep a deeper form it allows you to get deeper in there I just thought that material worked out really nice. It's, it has a nice tack to it. You can just pass that around. Pardon me? Glue. With us, uh, the question was, how do you attach it with the spray glue? It's uh, just some, I think, some 3M standard spray glue. It's not, uh, isn't anything special. It's just your normal craft stuff. And it seems to stick well. I'm, I'm sure there's better stuff out there that would uh, you wouldn't have to use the tape, that it would be one and done kind of thing. But um, this was just whatever was available at Walmart at the time. Um, so that's the universal chuck. I did have some other smaller chucks that I, I had some ball chucks that I thought might be fun to look at too. So these are, let me do, oh shoot, oh, don't work. So this one is a set to fit in a four jaw. So it's just a, you know, haul, I'm sure you guys have seen this before. And then this one, I just uh, did a matching taper for this. So it would just sit in the live center instead of having it run on a, and it actually is made for this one, but that won't fit in here. But this works out uh, pretty nicely for uh, holding spheres. And that material works for other stuff too. So I have a, a, a little bitty set of these pads. <laughs> They go in both ends of this, take a, so that when you're doing your final finish on it, you don't damage the. Ooh, that could have been fun. I think I found that the gray part of that works better than the uh, than the blue for a holding. You gotta get a little fussy with the pads, but that's been turned for a long time. But it'll allow you to sand it, you know. When you're doing the regular rough out and stuff, then you omit the pads because they they provide a lot of sloppiness to everything. But it'll just uh, those will turn up pretty nice. Yeah. Anyway, you get enough friction from Oh, you get enough friction from the from the cups themselves to drive the ball and change your accesses and stuff. I did have one other little semi improvement on the on that ball holding technology. There is insert a bearing in the back of it, and it allows it to mate up with the. And it allows a little bit of swivel there, so you get lots of you get lots of uh, adjustability. And it, it just self-centers it. It's uh, and it keeps you from. You could use it with a dead center, you know, up against that bearing. I just happened I just happened to have done a restoration, and I pulled some old bearings out, and I thought, whoa, you know, there's a nice even race for you. That should work. So I I thought I'd stuff it in there and see how it worked, and it. I'm, it was actually a pretty, I thought it was a pretty neat idea. The only thing that failed in that one was I used green wood to turn the ball with. That's a challenge. 
because you can't turn it fast enough to make it round as it changes. <laughs> I went from a ball that big around, I thought this was going to be an awesome ball to bring in and show these, you know, these old cups and stuff. And that ball went from like four inches diameter, it was down to about this size. <laughs> I threw it in a, in a pile of sawdust and thought, I don't even want to show that. <laughs> it looks like an egg now. But, but they do, the chucks work really nice. And this is actually the, the mating piece for that one. But these little guys, again, easy to make. They don't cost anything. And uh, they allow you to get uh, you know some work done fairly quick. And I don't throw any of this kind of stuff away. Anytime I have blocks left over, cutoffs from legs or anything, I just throw them into a, into a bucket. And it becomes your bucket of chucks. And it has, you know, there's little jam chucks in there that were for like an inside outside kind of thing. And this leftovers. And, uh, pieces like this because you can form them into a taper and you can just jam it into the headstock and use that as a as a drive or as a support on the other end. Um, anyway, so there's lots of lots of uh, lots of creative stuff that you can do in the in the chucking department. Holding a, speaking of the universal chuck, I don't that would not have worked. You, you remember you guys remember that big 18 inch bowl I brought in that, that big long deep one that sort of swore me off of big bowls. This was the jam chuck for that thing. So it, it actually, this is, a, speaking of creative jam chucks. So this was the, originally it was just a pattern that came out of the shop where I found that lathe. But um, I just uh, put a radius on the edge of it. And uh, to get it to stick to the, to the inside of the bowl, I used one of these. Sort of looks like a swimming thing, but it's not. Blowed, I blew it up and then that sat with a, a, not a lot of air on the inside of the bowl and provided the friction for the, for, uh, to do the, the bottom on the bowl. And it worked like a champ. So, you know, don't, uh, if you need some kind of padding material, you know, remember that almost anything will work as long as it has some tackiness to it and it'll, it'll grip, your, grip your work. Just be creative. But be careful. <laughs> this was, uh, it did spook me a little bit. And then this is the, the last little magic jam chuck thing that I just, we saw, saw this in a magazine not too long ago. It just fits right over your chuck. And for a hollow form, it fits in the, in the top of your hollow form. It gives you some grip and some movement to do the finish on the bottom of your bowl. I haven't been able to really figure out another good way. I tried to, to spin this around and use it that way, but I didn't, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of success with it. You, you know, you might, you might figure out something that works better than, than I could, but that's, that's kind of the, talk about being creative. I think that's, that showed up in one of the wood turning magazines. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, oh, I didn't, I didn't talk about collet chucks, um, aside from the ones that were homemade, but they do make um, these are, this is actually for a metal lathe, and it, this one has a half inch collet for it, but they, they come with different inserts. And this one, they're called spring collets or ER easy release collets. And they're just a tapered spring form cut so that whenever you squeeze down, you can see that there's a taper inside the cup. Whenever you squeeze that down, it squeezes down on the outside diameter. and. Um, and then this is what does the compression, you know, this just threads on. But uh, they come in lots of different sizes. And here's a, just a block with a different sizes. So if you're doing, if you're doing fussy work, if you, I don't know, I can't think of, Bill Ford, he's probably the only guy I can think of that, you know, did little things that, you know, would require, you know, that kind of a colic. But, but these things are neat, and, um, and they can come in real handy. They, they do really nice on making the knobs as well. The only problem with these are is it has a metal face on it. And that metal face can be, you know, a, a problem when, you're, uh, when you get up close to it on your tooling. Oh, and being creative for jam chucks. More creative jam chuck stuff. Because it's just a rubber ball, and rubber balls work really well uh, as, a, as a form of... Uh, uh, compression chuck, so keep that in mind. I guess you, people have used um, tennis balls, but yep, tennis balls, rubber balls, uh, anything inflatable. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's all 
goal. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I, that would have. Matter of fact, had I had one, <laughs> I probably would have used that instead of that. Um, what was it? There was one other. Oh, um, sometimes on your chucks, you'll get a piece that doesn't quite fit. Um, this is a. Let me see what I did with my. So this part is just marginally too small for the chucks. Now you could, you know, switch it over to a different size. Anytime I have something like this, this is right in between the maximum on one set of jaws and the minimum on the other set of jaws. But what I found was a piece of inner tube from a bicycle stretched over the end of this thing will often be enough. It's got enough stickiness to it that it'll allow you to turn it you know, get enough of a grip on it with your with that up. You got plenty of there's plenty of uh, grip on the on the item. So keep that in mind if you need. You know, you got something that's just just a tiny amount uh, too small to fit your chuck. You might be able to rescue the operation with a oversized rubber band from a tire tube. Anytime I get a flat tire, I just ball up the tube and cut off chunks when I need it. So that's a just a tip for when you screw up on your sizing. Um, Straight jaws, I think, with bar work. Yeah, I, yeah. They're effective, but I don't know that they're something I would use. John, what would you do to it? What they do? Is that working now? Yeah. yeah. And also, uh, you don't use that control. Um, I haven't. I haven't tried that. Uh, it seems vacuum trucks the. The question is, I haven't used vacuum trucks. I don't. I don't have any. I've thought about it. Um, I just hadn't got there yet. I guess. Yeah, I, I, I use like them, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, you can see that I spend a lot of money on accessories and things and, and so that would be right down my alley you know if I found something really cheap you know I might do it I, you know I'm a, I'm a part-time turner more than you know I do more furniture stuff more other stuff than I do you know just straight turning so I, I think that the idea of a vacuum chuck's a good idea um, you know it allows you to move quickly if you're a production turner I you know I would jump on that I think that'd be a smart move um, for you know one-off guys Oh, well, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, the, the comment was it takes nerves of steel to use one, especially with a thin bowl, because <laughs> it can suck it right in. So yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm not opposed to them, but it's just not something I've you know, jumped on. Any other questions? And I think we're done sweating for the night. Thank you. Thank you.